therapy or short E3CT. My name is Hildegard Bühning. I'm professor of infection biology of the gene transfer at Hannover Medical School and the current president of the ESGCT. Our society is a nonprofit organization promoting fundamental and clinical research in gene therapy, cell therapy, and vaccines. Education is an important part of our mission. Therefore, we launched the ESGCT eSchool in May this year. We are very pleased and thankful that highly recognized scientists and clinicians in the gene and cell therapy space, like our speaker today, are supporting our eSchool by giving a lecture. We are currently running part four of the lecture series, which is dedicated to safety aspects. Today, with the last talk of this series, we are focusing on genotoxicity. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Claire Booth from UCL, Institute of Child Health. Claire is a member of our board, and she has received a training in medicine and science, which is an ideal situation when you're being interested in gene and cell therapy. And indeed, Claire has set her focus on the field of primary immunodeficiency and gene therapy. She is performing preclinical laboratory research as well as translational studies, phase one, two clinical trials, and is cl in, involved in the clinical management of patients with primary immunodeficiencies. Today, she will speak on genotoxicity and what we have learned from STITX1 and about next generation tools for PID. We are very much looking forward to your talk, Claire. Thank you very much for the. Uh kind introduction and also for inviting me to speak um, on this ESGCT e-seminar series. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about genotoxicity and what we've learned from SCIDX1 um, and some of the next generation tools for primary immune deficiencies. Now there have already been some fantastic lectures in this series around gene editing tools and uh, genotoxicity associated with gene editing so I'm not going to cover that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Tony Kasoman talked about the uh, how to assess genotoxicity of, uh, for gene editing. So I'm going to focus really on, like we say, what we've learned from SCID in the gamma retroviral trials, and also focus on lentiviral vectors, which is what's really uh, in use now for all of the clinical trials uh, across a number of different diseases. These are my disclosures. So to go back to the beginning uh, for a moment, uh, looking at gene therapy for primary immune deficiency. So the hematopoietic stem cells or the CD34 compartment, these cells give rise to all the cells of the immune system and a block along that developmental pathway can lead to abnormal developmental function of the immune system cells. So a mutation in the hematopoietic stem cells can lead to an absence or poor function of white blood cells, lymphocytes and neutrophils. So by replacing that hematopoietic stem cell compartment, either through allogeneic bone marrow transplant from a healthy donor or through autologous gene corrected cells using the patient's own cells, then we can essentially overcome that block and allow the development of a functional immune system. So the premise of gene therapy is, is quite simple. We take the patient's bone marrow cells either through bone marrow harvest or through mobilized peripheral blood and apheresis. We uh, select out the CD34 positive cells, so those hematopoietic stem cell progenitors. Those cells are then incubated with a virus containing our transgene of interest. Those cells take up the gene, and then we return them to the patient, usually after some form of cytoreductive conditioning to allow space in the bone marrow for those gene-corrected cells to engraft. Now, one of the main positives of gene therapy is that because we're using the patient's own cells, it completely avoids the risk of graft versus host disease, which is a common complication of transplant, where the recipient, so the recipient sees the donor cells as foreign and causes uh, an immune reaction. We can also use a reduced amount of conditioning compared to transplant, so there's less toxicity associated with this procedure as well. So I've just put in this timeline because I think it's important to understand the history of the field and that's really what I'm going to be talking about as well. So the first trials really started for immune deficiencies and forms of SCID 30 years ago in, in 1990. Um, and as you can see from this graphic, uh, there have been a number of ups and downs. So ups in the early 2000s when the first successful gene therapy results were described for X-linked SCID and ABA SCID, 
followed fairly rapidly in 2003 uh, by uh, the reports of intestinal mutagenesis leading to leukemia in a number of the patients treated. And, and that's really what I'm going to focus on today. But since then, and it has taken some time, uh, we are seeing increased successes, increased uptake of uh, gene therapy now that we have safe, effective platforms to use for these treatments. So what have we learned from X-linked SCID? So X-linked SCID is a, an X-linked uh, condition where patients are essentially born without a working immune system and are highly susceptible to very severe infections. And without treatment, this condition is fatal usually within the first. So the first generation of gene therapy trials for, for SCID X1, which started in the 1990s, used a gamma retroviral vector where transgene expression, so here the IL-2 receptor gene, which is the gene responsible for the condition, that uh, expression was driven uh, by the viral enhancers in the gamma retroviral backbone. Um, and it was using the Maloney leukemia virus U3 promoter enhancer, which allowed strong expression of that transgene. So for patients who didn't have a suitable donor for transplant, they were entered into this trial and received transducer autologous CD34 bone marrow cells without any kind of uh, preconditioning or chemotherapy. Um, what we saw for the first time was that these patients had excellent T cell recovery and reconstitution. So of 18 patients, uh, long-term survivors treated across London and Paris where the sites were running, uh, these patients uh, essentially had a normal functioning T cell immune system with no opportunistic infection. However, after a few years, it became apparent that there were safety concerns um, in the form of insertional oncogenesis. So of the 20 patients treated, 10 in London and 10 in Paris, five developed a T-cell leukemia between two and five years, six years post-gene therapy. One of those patients died and the remainder responded to chemotherapy or transplant. And subsequently, 15 years after gene therapy, there's been a report that one of the Paris patients also developed a T-cell lymphoma related to the gene therapy. Um, and I will go into more detail about the, the mechanism of this, um, but this occurred because the gamma retroviral vector was inserting near to proto-oncogenes and activating them, leading to uh, the development of leukemia. And in five out of the six cases, this was a very specific uh, oncogene called LMO2. I will talk about this uh, a little bit later, but um, because of these adverse events, there was a period of time where these trials were halted while we really tried to work out why these patients had developed leukemia and how we could make this safer in the future. So I just want to focus on uh, the, the patient we had at Great Ormond Street Hospital just to give you an idea of how we went about trying to understand the mechanism. So, for the trial um, that I was referring to, 10 patients were treated at Great Ormond Street. All are alive and well, but one of our patients, patient eight, uh, developed T-cell leukemia. So when we tried to understand why that patient had developed leukemia, there were already reports coming out from Paris of uh, their patients also uh, developing similar complications. So when we looked at our patients, uh, they, when we immunophenotyped the leukemia, it was a fairly standard uh, TALL leukemia type. Um, we looked at whether the cells had more than one copy of the gene per cell or the virus per cell in case that had uh, led to some sort of uh, proliferation. There was no evidence of replication competent retrovirus. And we also looked to see whether the cytokine receptors, the gamma chain, the actual protein that we were expressing, um, was uh, not permanently on, uh, which could potentially lead to uh, proliferation. We also looked at the speed of the immune recovery of our patient to see whether perhaps this patient had recovered extremely quickly uh, and driven some sort of clonal pressure. But this wasn't the case, although his lymphocyte recovery was, was fast. Uh, it was in keeping with other patients who didn't develop leukemia. And when we looked at the gamma chain expression in this patient, uh, you can see here that the patient's gamma chain expression is essentially the same as, as the healthy control. There's no overexpression, which could have caused any problems. What we did find is that there was a vector integration uh, upstream of the LMO2 gene, and this is a known proto-oncogene. And what we could see from a leukemia panel that we ran was that the LMO2 gene was being upregulated, so that's activation of a proto-oncogene, but also in addition, CDKN2A, which is a tumor suppressor gene, was being downregulated. So you had this kind of double effect, which was predisposing to leukemia. 
And actually it became apparent that um, uh, not just for our patient, but for patients in, in the Paris arm as well, that it was an accumulation of genetic lesions that led to these specific patients developing leukemia. So for example, our patient had a translocation, uh, constitutively active notch one, and also, as I've said, a deletion in, in the tumor suppressor gene. So it was an accumulation of these that led to the development of leukemia. Um, this just shows you that at uh, day 717, which is when the patient presented, this uh, abnormal clone was evident on, on PCR. Actually, when we look back, the clone was present at an earlier time point, um, but also that it uh, completely was uh, obliterated after chemotherapy. And as I've just mentioned, uh, when other patients were looked at in the Paris trial, um, they all had these similar insertion sites around LMO2 and other protein oncogenes, but also additional chromosomal abnormalities, uh, which uh, we think is why these patients particularly developed the leukemia. So what had happened is that the virus, the gamma retrovirus had integrated close to these oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, and as well as driving expression of the transgene, which is what we wanted them to do, these viral LTRs, these strong promoter enhancer region, were also um, activating neighboring genes, and in this case, LMO2. So this led to the, once the mechanism of this had been understood, uh, this led to the development of a new vector for SCIDX1 called a self-inactivating gamma retroviral vector. So in essence, these uh, viral LTRs, which had uh, transactivated upregulated the proto oncogenes, these were removed, um, and uh, also all gamma retroviral coding regions were removed from the backbone. Because we removed the viral LTRs, which were essentially driving the transgene, which we wanted them to do, we had to put in an internal promoter, and in this case, it's a, a mammalian promoter, the EF1 alpha uh, short or EFS promoter, which now drives the transgene expression. Also uh, uh, added a post-regulatory uh, PRE, a post-translational regulatory element, to enhance expression. So this vector was developed, uh, and prior to going forward to, uh, to clinical use, um, we had to understand whether this did. Uh, I also want to mention that although I'm focusing on XGID, um, there were a number of other uh, primary immune deficiencies uh, for which a gene therapy approach was being developed. Um, and there were a number of gamma retroviral trials for these conditions. So I'm just going to mention a couple of those. So one is chronic granulomatous disease, or CGD. Uh, this is a condition which affects patients' neutrophils um, and neutrophil function. So these patients are extremely susceptible to severe infection, and also there's a strong inflammatory component to this disease as well. So as you can see from this table, there were a number of different uh, trials across centers uh, using gamma retroviral vectors uh, to treat this condition, different promoters in different configurations um, and slightly different conditioning regimes as well. Um, all of these patients did uh, show some initial clinical benefit, but for most of the patients treated in, in London, NIH and Seoul, this, uh, this clinical benefit wasn't uh, sustained because there wasn't any significant engraftment of gene-corrected cells for these patients in the myelin compartment. However, for patients who were treated in uh, Frankfurt and Zurich, these patients did have significant engraftment for more than three months, which was associated with clinical benefit, but that really was at the cost of genotoxicity. So both of those, uh, all of the patients uh, developed uh, some sort of clonal myeloproliferation. And so this is the vector that was used there, GP91 is the gene that's abnormal, uh, the protein that's uh, missing in uh, X-linked CGD. And in this uh, gamma retroviral vector, uh, the transgene was being driven by a viral promoter, the SSFE promoter. Um, and so this uh, led to three out of the four patients who were treated developing myelodysplasia with monosomy 7, secondary to MDS and EV1 insertions of the vector. Two of those patients received a, a transplant and one patient died following an episode of sepsis. What was also interesting in, in this trial was that um, uh, what you can see here is uh, this uh, gene-modified granulocyte. So you have integration into your, into your stem cell compartment in, in your granulocyte. Um, but what we saw was that actually the function of those cells, so the, the oxidase-positive cells, the percentage of that fell over time. Um, and so, as I said, this was a viral 
promoter that was being used to drive the transgene here, and that had actually undergone uh, methylation, and we ended up with transgene silencing. So although there was integration, uh, the transgene uh, no longer functioned, so it didn't provide any uh, sustained clinical benefit. Um, however, we did see the proto-oncogene activation and clone expansion. So again, a, a safer viral uh, platform was, was developed uh, for this condition. So this is now in clinical trial. This is a lentiviral vector, again, with a self-inactivating uh, backbone. And so here we've used the code and optimized form of the GP91 protein, the same as, as was used before. Um, but here the, the transgene is driven by a chimeric promoter, which is formed of uh, myeloid specific transcription factors with the aim of increasing expression or limiting expression uh, to the myeloid compartment where this protein needs to be expressed. So this trial has been open across a number of sites in Europe and the US uh, for almost eight years now, and uh, there have been no um, insertional events or, or, or adverse events related uh, to the lentiviral vector. Similarly, at the same time, gene therapy, gamma retroviral gene therapy was being developed and trialed for another primary immune deficiency called whisker audit syndrome, uh, which is again uh, a, a problem of T cells, but also the myeloid compartment. And these patients have uh, very low numbers of platelets, they have very severe eczema, and they also have a, a susceptibility to severe infections as well. So using the gamma retroviral vector uh, in the Hanover trial, 10 patients were treated. Nine of those 10 patients had sustained engraftment, uh, but unfortunately seven patients developed acute leukemia, six T cell ALLs and one AML. And again, this was retroviral vector close to oncogenes, and in this case identified LMO2, uh, MDS1 and LMM1 integrations. But again, additional genetic alterations were seen in these patients at the translocations. So moving forward, <clears throat> lentiviral vectors have been developed for whisker audit syndrome, which are in trial in a number of different centers. And here, the Wiscott, uh, the Wiscott uh, gene uh, is being driven by parts of the uh, Wiscott internal promoter. This was Alessandra Ute in, in Milan, was, uh, was one of the sites uh, who used this, um, uh, both the, uh, the, used the lentiviral um, gene, uh, gene therapy for whisker audit syndrome um, with really excellent clinical effects and benefits uh, published in Science uh, a number of years ago now. Uh, what was interesting was the comparison of integration sites in the gamma retrovirus and the lentiviral treated patients. So what you can see here in the gamma retroviral treated group is you have very few insertion sites and actually really very uh, a predisposition for this MECOM insertion site, which is what had led to the myelodysplasia. Whereas in the lentiviral uh, treated patients, uh, what you see is a far greater um, number of integration sites, uh, really with less um, predominance of, of any particular sites than those related to um, uh, cancer causing genes. So I said that a different kind of vector, the self-inactivating gamma retroviral vector or the lentiviral vectors have been used to move forward with uh, other clinical trials. So how do we assess the safety of a vector before it moves to clinical trial? So there's a, a number of ways to do this um, using both in vivo assays and in vitro assays, but both of them have, um, both of them have limitations uh, and, and, and complications. So in vivo assays really rely on neuroring studies and the mouse model may not be uh, the best uh, representation of the human situation. These assays are long, so it takes time to get a, a significant readout. And also in some of the xenotransplant models, um, it's dependent on the engraftment of human cells for some readers. So you have to have sufficient engraftment to be able to fully analyze, for example, integration site analysis. Um, in vitro assays are, 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 are favored, um, and these are accepted by regulatory agencies. And really here, I'm, I'm uh, talking about the in vitro immortalization assays, which I'll talk about uh, in a couple of slides. And these really assess the transforming capacity of transduced stem cells. Um, they are limited, however, because they have a myeloid bias because of the culture conditions used in the assays. Um, however, new assays are in development, which uh, may allow us to pick up transforming capacity uh, in lymphoid cells as well. So in the preclinical development and, and, and safety studies that we do before uh, a vector reaches uh, human use in clinical trial, we do biodistribution and toxicity assays, uh, 
I'm really just going to focus on the toxicity assays here and genotoxicity. But really, the question that we're asking is, does the vector cause clonal expansion in target hematopoietic stem cell progenitors? Um, so we can graft these cells into, into a mouse, and then we can look at target organs where we want the gene to be expressed. So in this case, the hematopoietic compartment and also non-target organs to look for essentially off-target toxicity. We look at the general health of the transplanted mice, but at the end of the experiment, uh, we can look at lineage distribution, hematopoietic organs in the transplanted animals. We can look at histopathology of the organs looking for any tumor formation or proliferation. And we can also undertake uh, PCR techniques in the bone marrow to look for integration site analysis. And then really from the non-target organs, we're asking if the vector can be found uh, where, uh, where we're not expecting it to be found. So this just gives you an idea of how we look for lineage distribution in, in treated animals. We, we, uh, we engraft lineage negative cells into a mouse model. Here I'm just using a, a P47 knockout mice as an example here, because this is a vector that we're working on preclinically. Uh, and what we want to do is compare um, what the compartments look like in mice who've received gene-corrected cells, uh, those who've received transplant, those who've received mock-corrected cells, and those who have um, received wild-type cells. Um, we, look for, we look at the different MOIs to see whether a very high MOI also has a toxic effect. Uh, we measure the copy number across these different compartments, so bone marrow, peripheral blood, spleen, and thymus. Uh, the red uh, dots here are the higher, uh, higher MOIs, so you would anticipate a higher vector copy number. Uh, but what we want to see here in the blood compartment, the bone marrow, the spleen, and the thymus, is that the distribution of uh, hematopoietic lineages, so T cells, myeloid cells, and B cells, is really comparable between the compartments, uh, sorry, between the treatment groups, suggesting that there's no adverse effects of uh, transducing your cells with a, with a vector. And that's exactly what we can see here. Um, we can take the organs from these animals after six months to look for any signs of proliferation or tumor. Uh, tumor formation. And we also undertake xenotransplantation models as well. So this is where we take human healthy donor, usually CD34 cells, we transduce them with, with a vector of interest. And then we engraft those into sublethally irradiated immunodeficient mice. So here we use the NSG mice strain. And after three months, we look for engraftment of human cells. Um, we do this by uh, PCR, looking for human albumin uh, against murine uh, titan protein. Uh, but what we really want to see is that there is engraftment of human cells. And you can see here in the bone marrow, we've got good levels of engraftment of around 50% uh, of human cells. So if we have that, then we can move forward to look at the integration on those cells. So linear amplification and mediated PCR or LAM PCR can be used to localize viral vector integration sites within the host genome. Um, so this can be performed in a, a restricted or non-restricted way. I'm going to focus on the, non uh, on the restrictive way here um, just to, to show you how this process works. So you have initial amplification of uh, vector genome junctions using biotinylated primers. Um, they've hybridized to the vector sequences. Uh, these are amplified, uh, and then you, using magnetic capture, you capture the biotinylated PCR products. This then undergoes double-stranded DNA synthesis and a restriction digest. Um, so then the uh, linker cassette is, um, uh, is ligated to the restricted DNA, and this carries a molecular barcode. And then you undergo a number of other steps of PCR, including a nested PCR uh, using biotinylated vector and adapter specific primers. Um, and then you have sequencing of the uh, PCR products. So usually uh, we work in partnership with GeneWork uh, using MySeq sequencing Illumina machine. Um, to, uh, to, to sequence these MySeq specific um, um, products. And the DNA barcoding is used to allow parallel sequencing of multiple samples in a single sequencing run. So in the restrictive, uh, in the restrictive PCR, you end up with some of these bands here, all corresponding to the number of integration sites. And in the non-restrictive uh, setting, you have more of a smear, again, suggesting a large number of integration sites. So this is the in vitro immortalization assay that I spoke about. So again, this uses generally neurone lineage negative cells as a starting point. Um, so this is, uh, these have been developed in Hanover really by Uta Modlik, uh, Axel Schanbeck, and Michael Roth. Um, and those are the groups that are working on, on, on further sort of um, uh, adapted uh, models of this. So 
In this in vitro immunization assay, um, urine and huge bone marrow cells are expanded for a couple of days before viral transduction, um, and then expanded further to check for copy number before a further expansion step. And then they undergo this replating assay. So essentially, if a, if a cell is predisposed to clonal proliferation, it needs more frequent replating. Uh, and you have a readout that looks essentially something like this. So the level of detection is always indicated here. And then the higher the replating uh, frequency, uh, the higher, the, the more the transforming capacity of those trans T cells. So what you're hopefully looking for is a negative assay. So, so these are mock trans T cells, so cells that have undergone a culture period but haven't been uh, transduced with any vector. And you can see there's no increased replating frequency here. This is a, um, a gamma retroviral vector showing a high re replating frequency, suggesting there's a, a higher uh, transformation uh, capacity. Uh, whereas in the vector that we're testing in preclinical studies, you can see uh, that there's no significant difference between those cells that are transduced with that vector and the mock cells transduced with no vector. Um, just to, to highlight here, in the red, these are the gamma retroviral vectors that have got the higher predisposition for, uh, for uh, uh, mutagenesis. Uh, and then in orange here is a lentiviral vector that's got a viral, vector, a viral promoter, again, which has a higher um, uh, transformation capacity. So moving back to X-linked SCID, this self-inactivating gamma retroviral vector had been developed and uh, demonstrated through in vitro immortalization assays and, and urine studies uh, that this looks safer. Um, but we wanted to know whether it proved to be safer in, in humans and also still as effective. So again, for patients who had no sibling donor available for transplant or matched unrelated donor, um, they were eligible for this study. Um, they underwent uh, bone marrow harvest and CD34 selection. Um, and then the transfused product was infused fresh into these patients without any conditioning. And this was a trial again carried out across a number of centers in the US and Europe. So this is the data that's already been published in the New England Journal a few years ago now. Uh, but what it shows is that this new vector platform um, allowed good immune recovery in the patients who were treated. So CD3 is your T cell marker and the gray lines really represent a normal range. And you can see that most of those patients have good improvement in their T cell numbers. And um, these are sustained over time and reach the normal range. These patients had a stable vector copy number above one in the T cell compartment. And PHA, stimulation index, which is a way we measure T cell function, we can see that these patients had very abnormal function pre-gene therapy, um, but after gene therapy, uh, those T cells function. So they were able to develop T cells which function. And when we looked at the kinet kinetics of immune recovery, the open blue circle is the old gamma retroviral vector that was associated with complications. And the black colored in circles are the new self-inactivating uh, design. Uh, we see that really there was very little difference in the kinetics of immune reconstitution. And certainly uh, by six months, there was, there was no difference in T cell numbers. So when we looked at the insertional profile associated uh, with the new self-inactivating configuration, what you can see is that there were still integrations in genes that had caused problems in previous trials, so NECOM, the myelodysplasia, and LMO2, which were seen in the previous executive studies. But the green lines is the old star vector, and the orange is the new star vector. And you can see that those integrations are far less frequent uh, using the new self-inactivating gamma retroviral vector. And looking across the genome as a whole, insertion near the lymphoid proto-oncogenes is far less frequent, significantly less frequent using this self-inactivating design. And so this is some data uh, that's published and also an update from Sun Young Pai in, in Boston, uh, who's leading this trial. Um, and of the patients who uh, were treated, 14 patients were treated. Um, one of the patients died uh, very early after the gene therapy from an existing uh, adenovirus infection. And two patients um, uh, required uh, further um, uh, to move on to a transplant. But what we've seen is, is very similar, uh, that patients of uh, the 13 patients um, who are alive, there's robust T cell reconstitution in these patients with up to nine years follow up now. So again, we can see that the, the T cells reach a normal number and that's sustained over time. And I've shown you the kinetics of that already. But what we see uh, in this unconditioned procedure was low um, engraftment in the myeloid compartment of B cells. 
So we only saw the sustained gene marking in T cell compartment where these cells had a survival advantage without, because we weren't using any conditioning to create any space in the bone marrow. Um, so you can see here the B cells in the myeloid compartment, there's, there's no gene marking. Um, so for the last patient who was included in that single gamma viral trial, um, they received a low dose B-cell conditioning, really just to create some space for these gene corrected cells to engraft. And this low dose B-cell that we use here is associated with really very minimal toxicity. So that final patient uh, received uh, bone marrow cells uh, after conditioning and demonstrated reconstitution of the T cells with normalization of T cell function, so the PHA response, able to clear coronavirus, that's a normal coronavirus. Um, and actually for the first time, what we saw uh, was B cell marking and marking in the myeloid compartment. So the addition of that low dose conditioning had allowed uh, gene uh, engraftment in the myeloid compartment, uh, gene marked B cells, functional B cells, um, which were then able to uh, mean that the patient could come off immunoglobulin therapy when they had sustained human recovery. Nonetheless, the field moved forward uh, and uh, a lentiviral vector was also developed for uh, X-linked skid. So in this vector, we have, again, the self-inactivating lentiviral backbone used in previous trials, uh, in the other trials that I've talked about, CGT and Wiscott, and also a code and optimized form of the IL-2 receptor gene being driven by that same EFS promoter. And so some neurine studies were undertaken to demonstrate that uh, this vector could uh, correct the phenotype in, 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 in gamma chain mice, uh, and that's, that's demonstrated here. And again, the safety studies that I talked about. So this is the in vitro immortalization assay, and this is the vector that we're taking, we took forward to trial, the EFS uh, IL-2 receptor gene lentiviral vector. And again, you can see that in the gamma retroviral uh, vector, you have increased replating frequency, suggesting a high risk of transformation potential. In the lentiviral vector with a viral promoter, again, a higher potential, uh, but significantly less uh, in, the, um, in the vector that we took forward. And what you get is uh, readouts like this, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in the context of patient monitoring. Um, but uh, in the lineage negative cells pre-transplant, you have a huge number of uh, integration sites and then the bone marrow cells and peripheral blood post-transplant, what you see again is a large number of unique integration sites. And then the top 10 most abundant integration sites, there's no dominant clone there. There's nothing that's uh, representing more than 30% of the cells that are being looked at. So just to really highlight that what we've learned from the Eklint uh, SCID trials, um, the first trial using the gamma retroviral vector and no conditioning, um, so uh, 17 out of 20 of those patients are alive. Uh, many of them uh, are still on immunoglobulin replacement because of a lack of B-cell engraftment. And six of those 20 patients developed uh, leukemia as a result of the, of the insertional mutagenesis. In the second trial, using a self-inactivating gamma retroviral vector uh, with generally no conditioning, um, those patients, uh, 13 of those 14 patients are alive. 11 have good T-cell reconstitution, but only the patient who received low-dose conditioning has got some B-cell engraftment and is able to come off in the drop in replacement therapy. Uh, and with a follow-up of over eight years now, none of those patients have um, had any vector-related adverse events. And now the current trial that's open between Boston, uh, LA, and, and London, um, and a number of other US uh, cities now, uh, Atlanta, to come on board, um, is using the self-inactivating lentiviral vector with a code optimized uh, transgene to improve expression, low dose B cell fan to enhance engraftment. Uh, and again, we haven't seen any um, vector related events so far, uh, but still very early days with that trial. And this just shows uh, of the lentiviral vector that we do still see very good T cell reconstitution, uh, very fast, actually by three months over a thousand T cells. Um, and then we also see the stable B cell marking and granular site marking um, over time. So this lentiviral vector uh, that's now in trial uh, does look as effective as the previous ones and also will have a safer, uh, um, a safer program. There's also another lentiviral XGID um, trial open at St. Jude's Hospital, UCSF in Seattle. Um, and this is using a, a similar lentiviral vector. Uh, it just has a, an additional insulator element. And again, these patients are receiving low-dose B-sulfan to uh, improve engraftment and allow patients uh, to develop humoral immunity. So 12 patients have been treated with 
a follow-up of around three years now for this patient. Um, and there have been no um, SAEs uh, related to uh, BSOF and, and these patients are all our patients now and the majority of uh, preventative medicine. Uh, again, the preliminary results of, of this trial were published in New England Journal last year, showing functional immune recovery, um, that there was B-cell engraftment in patients who were further out. Um, there was clearance of pre-existing infections and no new severe infections. Importantly, there was no evidence of malignant transformation to date. So I wanted to touch on another form of SCID, ADA SCID. Uh, and again, this was, uh, there were trials of gene therapy for ADA SCID around the same time in the 90s that there was uh, the trials for X-linked SCID. And a gamma retroviral therapy was used uh, for ADA patients um, with these trials carried out in Milan, London, and, and the US. Um, and of these patients who were treated, so 42 in this table, 100% of them are alive and 70, almost 75% had disease-free survival. So that meant 75% did not need to have a further procedure or go back onto enzyme replacement therapy, which is one of the treatments for this particular form of SCID. However, when we look at the integration site analysis for these patients treated with ADA SCID for the gamma retroviral vector, we do see uh, a predisposition for integration around transcriptional start sites, which is characteristic of the gamma retroviral vectors. And we also see insertions uh, in uh, genes that have led to complications in other trials. So for example, here, the green trials represent, uh, sorry, the green triangles represent the ADA skid patients, and the blue triangles represent uh, patients who um, develop myelodysplasia in the CGD trials I talked about earlier. So although there have been, uh, although there are integration sites in, 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 in genes that we've seen problems with previously, none of these patients with ADA have developed uh, any insertional mutagenesis or myelodysplasia or leukemia. So there's a specific um, disease-related effect here um, that's not entirely clear, um, but I, I wanted to show you that there is significant follow-up for this gamma retroviral vector. Uh, it's now licensed, uh, licensed in Europe as Stromvelis, um, and this is um, so patients uh, can travel to Milan uh, where, uh, with Professor Aiti there and can receive a, a fresh gene therapy uh, product using this gamma retroviral vector. So to date, 34 patients have been treated across a number of different programs with up to almost 20 years follow-up, and none of these patients have developed uh, any leukemic transformations. Um, they do show long-term engraftment of gene-corrected cells. They have improved immune function. Uh, they don't have such severe infections anymore, and they're metabolically detoxified because this particular form of skid has a, a metabolic component. So the treatment with this is effective over, over a long period of time without evidence of leukemic transformation, despite um, integration sites close to genes that have been problematic. So nonetheless, for ADA skid, an antiviral vector was also developed, uh, again, in line with those I've shown you. So this is the self-inactivating antiviral vector with a codon-optimized form of the ADA gene driven by the EFS promoter. Um, and this is in trial uh, in the UK at Great Ormond Street here and in the UCLA with, with Don Cohn. And we've been testing both fresh and frozen formulations of this product now. Um, and, and, and this is how we, how we monitor our patients. It's very similar to what I, what I showed for the uh, preclinical studies. Um, but what we have is a readout like this where we assess the 10 strongest clones over time. So this is an integration site analysis, clonality analysis. Uh, and what you can see again is that you have uh, gray bars, which represent the unique integration sites, and then these color bars, which represent the top 10 strongest clones. And what we generally see is something called transient clonal dominance. So at one particular time point after the gene therapy, uh, there will be one clone, which is your number one. So for example, this one here. But then at the next time point that you look at that patient's cells, that's gone. And so it's been replaced by something else. And that's what we want to see essentially is this, is this transient clonal dominance, that we don't have one particular clone that is evident at like a high percentage, so it's at 10, 20, 30%, and that that increases over time. So this is a very reassuring pattern uh, you know, with a, a lot of gray bars and very small colored bars representing those, those strongest clones. So we will routinely do this in the follow-up of our gene therapy treated patients across our trials now at, at various time points. So just to summarize for the lentiviral ADA gene therapy, uh, between ourselves in, in London and Don Cohn in UCLA, we've treated 59 patients across uh, different trial protocols with 100% survival and 97% of patients have been able to stop their enzyme replacement 
have sustained immune reconstitution, enzyme activity, and remain detoxified. And again, we've seen no insertional oncogenesis in any of these patients treated. So we're in a really privileged position, actually, in, in, in the context of SCID. Uh, this is an overview of the current and planned SCID trial. So we have a number of different platforms um, available now. So as I've said, uh, ABA SCID uh, Streamfellis is a licensed product in Europe with gamma retroviral vector, which can be used, um, and also the lentiviral trials I've spoken about. Uh, for X-linked SCID, there's two open lentiviral trials uh, using cryopreserved products, uh, and then also a gene editing trial is planned at Stanford. And then other forms of SCID are also being uh, uh, um, managed with uh, gene therapy. So Artemis SCID, again, a lentiviral platform, which is open in San Francisco, and RAG1 SCID, a lentiviral cryopreserved product, which is going to be opening in Europe later this year. So despite the trials and challenges that we, we saw in the beginning, uh, in the early 90s, uh, particularly in the context of, of X-linked SCID, uh, we're now in a position where we've understood what's happened uh, we've been able to develop safer vector platforms to use, and we've seen uh, really uh, great successes um, with those with those lentiviral platforms. And in terms of lentiviral experience, um, over 200 patients have been treated now across multiple programs with no genotoxicity concerns to date. Um, the regulatory agencies now stipulate long-term follow-up studies are required for any patient receiving an integrative vector, so that's gamma retroviruses and lentiviruses, and that follow-up is now required to be 15 years. And these are the lentiviral uh, vectors that are in trial at the moment. Now, not just for the immune deficiencies, which I've talked about, we now have the lentiviral platforms for ADA SCID, X SCID, X linked CGD, WISCOT, and leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So these platforms are now being used across a number of other diseases, so beta thalassemia, sickle cell disease, and Fanconi, metabolic conditions, ALD, NRD, and, and NTS, and also skin conditions, so epidermolysis, bullosa. So we're really gaining a lot of experience with this particular data to demonstrate that it does certainly look safer than the older gamma retroviral vector platforms. So I mean, this is, these trials and these preclinical studies are, are the work of huge a number of people, and this is just uh, a few mentioned here, and also a, a lot of our funders, um, but really there's a lot of work that goes into to developing these, um, and I'd just like to say thank you to all the people who've been involved in that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that, that might come. Thank you very much. Claire, for this great overview and for sharing with us all the details and explaining them. Um, while we are waiting for the first question from the chat, uh, um, may I allow, be allowed to ask you your personal opinion, what you think com the comparison of the risk and benefit situation when it comes to a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation versus um, the classical hematopoietic stem cell uh, a transplantation versus uh, gene therapy? for the uh, prim yeah. primary immunodeficiencies? No. Yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. And I think and one thing um, that I think is important to recognize is that actually the outcomes for transplants have really improved over the past 20 or 30 years as well with the advent of new technologies like T-cell depletion um, and, and the way that these, um, these grafts are selected. Um, so I think really, things have to be considered not just on a disease specific basis, but also on a, on a patient specific basis as well. Um, we know that, for example, in the context of transplant, patients with active infections you know, do much worse. Um, but in the context of gene therapy, uh, that may not be so bad because we use less conditioning and we have a sort of faster immune reconstitution. So there's certainly uh, risks and benefits for both. Um, but overall, I think that um, you know, these don't have to be one or the other treatments. You know, these are things that we can now offer patients as alternative therapies uh, once we have you know, better evidence of, of the long-term effects of gene therapy. Uh, and that's the other issue that you know, the primary immune deficiencies are extremely rare diseases. And only really by collaborating with other centers and doing parallel trials uh, for gene therapy can we collect enough data to be able to demonstrate the long-term efficacy of these of these treatments. So we're still in that stage at the moment of, of generating that data. Um, uh, and obviously transplants been around for much longer and that data already exists. Although, as I've said, 
many of the outcomes are improving over the past few years with new technologies. Thanks. Uh, we have received a question from Lex Lansing from the Frank Buchholz Lab in Dresden. And first of all, he thanks you for your nice talk. And then the question is, do you think a gene correction therapy, so G based editing or no integration, is safer than a gene replacement therapy? Yeah, of course, that's a very um, poignant question at the moment because there's so much work going on into, into gene editing and base editing. And, and I think the reality is that we just don't know at the moment. Um, there's certainly some conditions where um, gene editing uh, offers uh, benefits. Um, and so, for example, one of the things that I haven't really talked about is that sometimes with the corrective therapies or the augmentative therapies where you're adding a gene and you're having ubiquitous expression of that gene, that can also cause problems. So, for example, like signaling molecules and CD40 ligand deficiency, for example, where constitutive activation of your transgene is a problem. So in those situations, uh, gene editing where you're running or base editing where you're running um, you, the expression of your, of, your, of your corrected copy of the gene uh, from the native promoters and regulatory elements, you know, that should definitely be safer from that context. Um, but in terms of in terms of, of base editing, particularly, um, you know, there's I think there's so few conditions that will be um, where that may be amenable to in the context of primary immune deficiencies, because in primary immune deficiencies, you know, really you have a whole range of mutations generally uh, across these genes, and so then doing a you know, sort of an augmented gene procedure. Uh, will correct all of those different mutations rather than uh, just that you, you don't have hotspot mutations which would be amenable to, to base editing. But I think at the moment we just, we don't, you know, as like I say, Tony gave an excellent talk the other week about the, the toxicity or how do we assess uh, you know, any potential toxicity of editing techniques. Um, and, but you know, until we've done that in the in vivo setting in the human clinical trials, I think uh, it'll be very difficult to answer that question properly. Thanks. So Frank Stahl uh, asks, has any cis um, in lentiviral trials been observed over a longer time, maybe beneficial clonal dominance? So common integration sites. Sorry, I missed the first part of that. Sorry, has any common integration site in lentiviral trials been observed over a longer time, maybe beneficial clonal dominance? Uh, no, so not, not to my knowledge. Um, I think um, you know, one of the one of the interesting cases is um, is in the Fanconi uh, trial, where this is a condition where there's um, you have very few stem cells, and so the number of stem cells that have been transduced and, and infused into the patients in those trials in an unconditioned setting um, you know, has really been very small compared to ours. And this was published by Juan Brown's group, uh, I think, uh, earlier this year or, or late last year. Um, and again, if you, if you look at the integration site analysis uh, for those, you do see that there is you know, significant some, some clonal dominance, in, especially in those early time points when there's only a few engrafted clones that are, that are driving that hematopoiesis. And in that situation, I think that's obviously beneficial uh, for the patients. Uh, but in the other trials, I'm not sure that there has been beneficial uh, clonal dominance um, sort of reported. Okay, thanks. Can you maybe also comment on the age of the patients when you, say you recommend or think a gene therapy should be performed? Sure. So, um, so I think historically we've always thought that the earlier these therapies can be performed, then the better the outcome. Um, across across all of the different diseases, the primary immune trials. Uh, sorry, Claire, I couldn't, so, sorry, Claire, we couldn't get you. There was an interruption. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, so uh, across all of the trials that um, I, I mentioned, we have actually treated older patients. So in ADA SCID, we've treated some patients who were, uh, um, were sort of uh, up in the, in the early teens um, with success. And, um, and similarly, ex SCID, there have been trials where older patients have been treated. And in Wiscott and CGD, adults were treated, so up to 30 years old. Um, and so the concern always was about the stem cell compartments and whether that was going um, you know, to be sufficient to uh, sustain a, a long-term recovery. 
And actually, you know, we, we have seen that. Uh, we have seen that in our in our patients. So um, although I think, yes, we still expect a greater benefit from treating at a younger age, as you do with, with bone marrow transplant, um, we are able now to treat adult patients successfully. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions. So again, I really would like to thank you, Claire, for this wonderful talk. And I would like also to invite our audience to join us next week. Please, uh, we have a change from Wednesday to Thursday. It's the 24th of September. And Alessandra Ayuti uh, from San Rafael Teleton Institute for Gene Therapy in Milan will speak about 25 years of experience of gene therapy for ADA skid, bringing a medicinal product to the approval. And again, thank you very much.